Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, uh, what a joy this is already to be here. This was worth the trip just to be able to sing with you and uh, to hear the passion of your heart expressed to the Lord and to one another in your singing. Uh, thank you to the worship team for the way that you have already uh, been used by God to stir our hearts. Uh, I've been here the last two days. We've had a wonderful conference uh, here at Grace Bible Church, and we've had about 135 pastors here uh, as we've talked about uh, biblical preaching. And, and now we really just keep going up the mountain, and it just keeps getting better. And what an incredible turnout. I just want to uh, give thanks to the Lord for the way He's drawn so many of you here uh, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. This has been uh, on my calendar, and I have been anticipating being here with you. And now that I'm here, in many ways, this exceeds my expectation. And I pray that God will use this time in our lives in a very significant way. So, um, Dick Gregory, thank you so much for the invitation and for your leadership here. And how the Lord is using you in this church and in this community and far beyond um, is an extraordinary thing for me to step into what the Lord is doing here for this brief period of time. And Justin, thank you so much for being the, the brains behind this, as it has already been said. And it's a joy to be able to partner with you in ministry in this way. So are you ready to look into the Bible together with me? Uh, take your Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. And tonight I want us to look uh, at verses 1 through 12. We're going to spend our entire conference looking at these verses, but I want to give a little bit of an overview tonight. And then tomorrow in our three sessions we'll work our way more more carefully and more deliberately uh, through these verses. I want to begin by, by reading these verses, and I think we've called this the upside-down kingdom, something like that, and I think you'll see how the kingdom of God is totally inverted from the way the world operates. So Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, this is God's inspired and inerrant and infallible Word. When Jesus saw the crowds, He went up on the mountain, and after He sat down, His disciples came to Him. He opened His mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And these verses are known as the Beatitudes, and it's been well said, these are attitudes that ought to be. 
they launch what has become known as and regarded to be the greatest sermon ever preached on planet earth by unquestionably the greatest preacher who ever walked this earth, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. This is the first recorded sermon that we have to come from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is easily the most profound, the most penetrating, and the most powerful. It, it was a landmark sermon in which Jesus defined what is the kingdom of heaven. And who are those who enter the kingdom of heaven? And how do they enter the kingdom of heaven? And how do you grow in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, all of that is contained in this Sermon on the Mount. And this is front-loaded at the very beginning and gives us an understanding of the kingdom of heaven. Never was a sermon more necessary, and never was a sermon more timely than this sermon as the Lord Jesus spoke to the, degener the degenerated condition of the state of dead religion in Israel. And Jesus characterized Israel in the words of Isaiah the prophet, who said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Uh, the religion of the scribes and the Pharisees was utterly bankrupt at the time Jesus issued this sermon. And the religion of Israel had become a religion of external facades and empty activities and meaningless ritual and mindless routine. They had religion, but they had no reality in their own hearts and in their own lives. They had all the outward trappings of religiosity, and they knew how to play the game of religion, and they knew how to sound so religious, and they knew how to pray so religious, and they knew how to fast so religious, and as they gave this appearance of religion, the fact of the matter is they were utterly bankrupt in their own hearts and souls. They were unregenerated. They were unconverted. They were what we would say they were religious but lost. And so Jesus launched this famous sermon with what has been called the Beatitudes. These are the marks of true saving faith. These are the marks of true conversion. These are the marks of true salvation. These are the marks of true godliness. These are the marks of true piety. Never has so much been said in so few words. And at the end of this sermon on the mount, Jesus will say, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who are on it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. What the Beatitudes define is the narrow gate that leads into the kingdom of heaven. And what these Beatitudes define is who is on the narrow path that leads to life. For Jesus will say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many wondrous works? Oh, they were so religious. But I will say unto them in that day, depart from me, you who work lawlessness. 
Truly, truly, he who hears these words of mine and acts upon them is like a very wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rains came and the winds blew and beat against the house, they did not fall because they were built upon the rock. Here is the description of the rock that characterizes those who have built upon this solid rock. And he who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them is like a very foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And when the rains came and the winds blew and beat against the house, great was its fall because it was built upon the sand. These verses at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount define the narrow gate. These verses at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount define the narrow road that leads to life. What we are looking at in this conference is not secondary. It is supreme. What we are looking at is not peripheral. This is primary. This is who's in and who's out. No matter how religious we may be, who is in the kingdom? Who is out of the kingdom? Who may enter the kingdom? And who is advancing and growing in the kingdom? The main thing is to keep the main thing The main thing, brothers, this is the main thing. These are the first words to come in a recorded sermon by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they are of first importance for those of us who have interest in the kingdom of heaven. Now tonight, I want us to look at five things as we will survey the Beatitudes, and then beginning in the morning, we will work our way one at a time through these Beatitudes. So I want you to note first, as we look at these verses, the preacher of blessedness. There has never been a greater preacher than the preacher of this sermon. This preacher came forth from God was sent by God, and is the greatest preacher who has ever preached on this planet. This is none other than the Prince of Preachers, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the King over the Kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. So we begin reading in verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds. Would you please note it wasn't just a crowd that came. It wasn't just a large gathering that assembled there that day, but that this was, these were crowds in the plural. Do you see that in your Bible? And this was an an enormous gathering of people and the multiplied thousands who came to hear this preacher speak. If you would look at the previous verse in verse 25, at the end of chapter 4, we, we gain some idea of the enormity of the crowd that came together. And it is a, a large crowd like this that pulls something out of a preacher when, when he stands to preach. And so we note in verse 25, large crowds, not, not just crowds, not just a crowd, but mega crowds large crowds, swelling multitudes, massive throngs of people followed him. And notice how they came from from far and wide. Notice it says from Galilee. They, They came from places like Cana and Chorazin and Capernaum and Nazareth and Bethsaida. And then it says they came from Decapolis, Uh, That was a confederation of ten cities south of Galilee, and they came pouring out of these ten cities, Decapolis, to come hear our Lord. 
And then we see in Jerusalem, that was the religious center of the, of the nation of, of Israel. And then it says, and Judea, and that would be Bethlehem and Bethany and Jericho. And then it says, and from beyond the Jordan, uh, such places as Perea and other parts east of Jerusalem. Do you get the idea here of the enormity of the gathering of the people as they have come and flocked together to hear this great preacher of the kingdom of heaven? Uh, Huge crowds were flocking to Jesus from far and wide all over the entire nation in a wave of popularity with the masses swept over his ministry, such was unprecedented and had never been seen in the history of the nation. Now look at verse 23 at the end of chapter 4. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He was an itinerant evangelist. He was an itinerant teacher. And he was constantly on the move and constantly on the go and going from city to city and from synagogue to synagogue. He he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And it says he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And that added to the electricity in the air as people had to be there to to see this and to hear this. And then in verse 24, the news about him spread beyond all Syria, north, south, east, west, Jerusalem, Galilee, all of the cities. They were flooding and they were flocking to hear him preach. They were coming for all different kinds of reasons. Some came out of curiosity. Some wanted to hear it for themselves and see it for themselves. Others came, they just wanted to be wherever a crowd is. People attract people. Others came because they just wanted to know more of the truth. And others came because they're very religious. And this is a religious leader. And people are attracted to religion. And some had committed their lives to Him. And they came, from, they came for many different reasons. And the reason I make this point is that as Jesus will give the Sermon on the Mount... And as Jesus will begin with these Beatitudes, He is preaching to a very mixed congregation. There are those who are committed. There are those who are curious. There are those who are uh, interested. There are those who simply want to be where a large crowd is. And so we read in verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, He did what any preacher would do. He would seize the moment. He would capture the opportunity. He must preach and He must direct them in matters of the kingdom of heaven and begin to peel the layers of dead flesh off of their dead religion and expose the reality of what true religion is. So when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. This was very strategic because it put him in an elevated place where his voice could project and where thousands of people could hear our master speak. And after he sat down, and this was the authoritative position of the rabbi or the teacher in this day and time, his disciples came to him 
And he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, This is the greatest preacher opening his mouth and now bringing the greatest sermon that would ever be preached. Not only did they need to hear this, but you and I here tonight need to hear this as well. We need to hear what the greatest preacher has to say about the kingdom of God. We need to hear what Jesus has to say about the kingdom of heaven. And at the end of this sermon in chapter 7 and in verse 28, when Jesus finished these words, the crowds were amazed at His teaching. And the word amazed means they were out of their mind. They were astonished. They were bewildered. They were dumbfounded. Never had they heard a preacher like this. In verse 29, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Oh, may we be astonished yet again with the profundity and the precision with which our Lord speaks to the heart of every person who will hear His words. If there is ever a preacher that you have ever listened to, this is the preacher you need to hear. This is the greatest preacher on the greatest subject, those who are in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you to note, second, the promise of blessedness. We've seen the preacher. Notice the promise of blessedness. Never did a sermon begin in a more positive manner than this sermon as Jesus comes promising the blessing of God and the blessing of heaven upon those who will rightly respond to this sermon. Right now, He is throwing open the gates of heaven. He is throwing open the gates of paradise. And He is promising the blessings of the throne of grace upon those who will enter in through this narrow gate. Notice how he begins in verse 3. Blessed. This is far from beginning with a message of of doom and gloom. He, He comes pronouncing blessed. And he will do so in consecutive fashion. Notice he will begin. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. Blessed are those when people insult you. It's just blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing is flowing from his mouth, this promise. But Descending down from heaven upon those who will respond rightly to this message. This is the greatest promise that has ever been extended and offered. Now, what does this word blessed mean? What what is the promise of this blessedness? Well, there's a twofold meaning there is a primary and there is a secondary meaning to this word makarios. The primary meaning is that this is the promise of being graced and being favored by God in a state of saving grace. The opposite of being blessed is to be cursed. Everyone is either blessed or they are cursed. Everyone is either under the blessing of God or they are under the cursing of God. There is not a a, a middle position here. It is black and white. It is one way or the other. And to be cursed is to be under the, the wrath of God. And to be blessed is to be under the grace and the saving favor and mercy of God. It is to have a standing in grace. It is to be in 
the kingdom. All who are in the kingdom are blessed by God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 3, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Sometimes people will ask me as I travel around, brother, have you had the second blessing? I'll just laugh and I go, the second blessing? I've had every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. They're not being measured out with an eyedropper from heaven. He has swung open the windows of heaven and poured out His blessing upon those who have entered into His kingdom. The primary meaning of blessed, we could say favored, saved, justified, forgiven, redeemed, blessed. The secondary meaning is to be satisfied in God. It is to be filled with the joy that only God can give. And what a difference there is between the happiness that comes from this world and the joy that comes from only God above. The world can give happiness, and even we as believers can sometimes experience by common grace the happiness. Uh, When my football team wins, I'm still happy. When my team loses, I'm not as happy. And that is dependent upon my, my circumstances. And when my happenstance is good, then my happiness is up. And when my happenings are down, then my happiness is down. But what a, what a shallow way to live life. This blessedness, this joy, this inner peace, this inner contentment is not dependent upon any happenings that take place in this world. Because it does not come from this world. It comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. It comes from out of this world. It comes down from the throne of God as I am rightly related to Him. And it is joy unspeakable and and full of glory. And that is the blessedness. That is, this is the promise that our Lord is extending. Nine times in these ten verses, Jesus pronounces and promises this divine blessing. And as you find yourself here tonight, if you are outside the kingdom of God, I want you to know that the Lord Jesus extends His blessing to you if you will respond and come to Him in the manner in which He prescribes how He loves to receive those who are outside the kingdom. He is a friend of sinners. And He says, Him who comes unto Me, I will in no wise cast out. And it brings Him glory and it glorifies the Father when He bestows the fullness of His blessedness in grace upon those who are strangers and aliens to His kingdom, who are brought in to be citizens of His kingdom. Oh, it would thrill His heart for you to come to Him tonight and gather you in. He's come not for those who are well, but for those who are sick. He is a physician who has come not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. And as you find yourself here tonight, if you are already in the kingdom... There is a fluctuation in our experience of this joy. And there are times when our joy is greater than at other times. And what we shall look at in these opening verses will speak very directly to how we can know more of the joy of the Lord in our life. This is the very blessedness that Jesus Christ is promising and offering to you tonight. Now, I want you to note third. I want you to note the paradox of blessedness. 
Because this is so paradoxical. This is so antithetical. This is so inverted. This is so upside down. This is so counterintuitive. This is so opposite of what the world thinks concerning how to experience this blessedness. So notice what he says, blessed are the, what is this in verse 3? The poor in spirit. I, I, I've never been happy when I have been poor. I, I, I've been poor much of my life. Anyone who goes to seminary is basically <laughs> very, very poor. I, I, I've never been happy when, or even joy f- factor up when, when I've been poor. How, how shocking this must have sounded to their ears that day. The very opposite that they would have ever thought that they would have ever heard to come from the lips of a preacher, blessed are the poor in spirit. And in verse 4, he's, this is so counterintuitive. He says, blessed are those who mourn. Happy are those, or joyful are those who mourn. This doesn't even make since the world says, happy are those who are frivolous and re- gregarious and, and, and partying and, and, and just uh, almost silly. But Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. What is he saying? And then verse, fi- verse 5, blessed are the gentle. No, the world says, happy are those who push their way to the top those who push their agenda, those who get their way. Jesus says, not in my kingdom. Blessed are those who are gentle. And then he says in in verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and and thirst. The world says, happy are those who, who are stuffed. Happy are those who are bloated. Happy are those who are ready to burst. Happy are those who have an open-ended buffet. And Jesus says, no, not in my kingdom. It's the very opposite of what you may think. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst In verse 7, he says, blessed are the merciful. (laughs) The world says, no, blessed or happy are those who stand up for their rights and who demand their way and who intimidate and, and who push. And Jesus says, no, blessed are the merciful. You try to sell that in the Roman Empire? You try to sell that under the imperial might of Caesar, blessed are the merciful. And then in verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart. (laughs) The Roman Empire, with all of its fornication and all of its adultery and all of its homosexuality and all of its lesbianism and, and, and all of its cesspool of moral filth, they, would, they, they said, happy are those who, who, were, who were sexually involved. And Jesus says, oh no, my kingdom is totally different. Blessed are the pure in heart. And then verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. The world says, happy are those who get a piece of the action. And Jesus says... Blessed are the peacemakers. And then finally in verse 10, the toughest cell of all. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. (laughs) The world says, happy are those who are popular and who are rich and famous and who have the world at their beckoning call. Who have people who applaud them and people who serve them and people who coddle them. 
And Jesus says, oh no, in my kingdom, which is totally different from the kingdoms of this world, in my kingdom, blessed are those who are roughed up and who are rejected and who are ostracized and who are persecuted and even those who are, who are martyred. Admittedly, by human standards, these words were the strangest words that that crowd would ever hear. But isn't this the way the kingdom of God operates? Everything is upside down in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. If you will humble yourself you will be exalted. And Jesus said, if you keep your life, you will lose it. If you lose your life, you will keep it. And Jesus said, if you give, it will be given to you. But if you hoard, even what you have will be taken away from you. And Jesus said, if you live for self, you will die. But if you will die to self, you will live. And Jesus is saying here, if you will be poor, then you will be rich. If you will mourn, then you will be comforted. If you will be gentle, then you will be strong. If you will be empty, then you will be filled. Those who would enter into the kingdom of God must march to the beat of a totally different drummer. They must turn a deaf ear to the world's standards. They must turn a deaf ear to the world's approval. And they must deny themselves. They must take up a cross and they must follow after the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Alexander McLaren, the great Scottish Baptist preacher of the 19th century, writes, quote, The Beatitudes as a whole are a set of paradoxes to the mind of the flesh. They were meant to tear away the foolish illusions of the multitude as to the nature of the kingdom. And those who heard must have been disgusted and turned back many would-be sharers in it. This was like, he says, a dash of cold water into their face. And only those who were spiritually minded would hear his words. And only those whose minds and hearts were being prepared by the Spirit of God and these words penetrating down to the bone would receive them. The paradox of blessedness. If you are to enter into the kingdom of heaven, and if you are to grow in the kingdom of heaven, if you are to enter through the narrow gate, and if you are to proceed down the narrow path, everything in your life must become inverted and antithetical and paradoxical to the way this world thinks. Now, I want you to note fourth, the possession of blessedness, because at the end of each of these beatitudes is a fuller explanation of what it is to be blessed. Notice in verse 3, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The word are is present tense, right now, this very moment, not later, not after the second coming of Christ, not in heaven later, not in a future time or age, but right now, this very moment, tonight, right where you sit, within your own soul right now, blessed are the pure, uh, the poor in spirit, for theirs is, present tense, right now, not will be one day, but is right now, the kingdom of heaven. That is to say, you may possess the kingdom of heaven now, this moment, the sphere of salvation, the realm of redemption, 
within your soul if the king will preside over your life. He says, blessed are, present tense, in verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, and the shall be is a promise of, of, of certainty. These are the ones who will be comforted in the here and now, those who mourn. In verse 5, blessed are, present tense again, the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are, this moment, those who, verse 6, hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Every one of these are in the present tense as you live your life today, as you go back to your home, as you go to your place of of, of work, as you go into the marketplace, as you go to school, as you go back to your neighborhood, what Jesus has to offer is not postponed, it is not suspended for a later time, it is for those right now. It is for us right now. Blessed are the merciful, verse 7, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. This is the present possession that the Lord desires you to have this very moment tonight. You may have and experience this right now. You may have this this moment. You may have walked in here outside the kingdom. You may walk out inside the kingdom. You may have walked in in the kingdom and your joy in a declining state of experience. You may walk out tonight with your joy greatly increased in your experience in the Lord tonight. Finally, and all of this is just by way of, of introduction for what we will be looking at tomorrow. Finally, I want you to see the path to blessedness. The path to blessedness because as our Lord lays this out, He outlines for us the steps that lead into the kingdom. And in the first four Beatitudes, we have the top tier of His blessedness, the first level of His blessedness. And in verses 3 through 6, these first four Beatitudes are Jesus' four spiritual law booklet. These lead the sinner into the kingdom of heaven this is how you enter through the narrow gate. You must be poor in spirit. You must recognize your own spiritual bankruptcy, that in my hands no price I bring. You must declare bankruptcy before a holy God in heaven. You have nothing whatsoever in and of yourself to bring to the table you have no spiritual capital by which you may gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. It begins by being poor in spirit. And then second, it's not enough to simply know this. You must mourn over your spiritual poverty. You, you must be one whose heart is struck that you have offended a holy God in heaven and have fallen short of what He desires for you. And you weep and you mourn over your own sin. And then you must humble yourself beneath the mighty hand of God and be gentle and be meek and lower yourself in the presence of the Lord. And then in verse 6, hunger and thirst for a righteousness that you cannot achieve hunger and thirst for a righteousness that, that you cannot 
uh, work up from within yourself. You must hunger and thirst for a righteousness that Martin Luther says is a foreign righteousness, is an alien righteousness that comes from outside of yourself, that is a, a righteousness that must be given to you on the basis of another, the righteousness achieved by Jesus Christ Himself through His sinless life and through His substitutionary death. These first four Beatitudes are the steps by which everyone enters into the kingdom of heaven. No one comes strutting through the narrow gate. No one comes giggling through the narrow gate. No one comes boasting of their spiritual riches when they come through the narrow gate. And no one comes holding on to their own righteousness as they come through the narrow gate. Everyone, with no exception, who enters through the narrow gate are poor in spirit and who mourn over this poverty and who are gentle and who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And having entered through the narrow gate, you now proceed down the narrow path and you continue to acknowledge your spiritual poverty in and of yourself. You continue to mourn over your own sin. You continue to walk in gentleness and humility. And you continue to hunger and thirst, not for an imputed righteousness, but for an imparted righteousness that would come from God Himself. This is the first tier of the Beatitudes, which leads now to the second tier of the Beatitudes. This is like the Ten Commandments. The first four govern my relationship with God. The last six govern my relationship horizontally to others around me, my parents, and to those who uh, live around me. And so it is with these Beatitudes. The first four deal with my re- first four deal with my relationship to God. These last four deal with my relationship with others and with myself. So in the second tier of Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful. This is the result of your having received mercy from God. Those who receive mercy in the gift of grace become those who are merciful to others and share this mercy. He says, blessed are the pure in heart. All who enter into the kingdom have received a new heart. God has taken out their heart of stone and given them a heart of flesh. And God has written His law upon the tablet of their heart and put His Spirit within them and caused them to walk in His statutes. And there is now a a new heart within them and a new desire now to pursue holiness. Not perfectly, none of us can live to that. But there is a new desire and passion for purity, is there not? All who have entered through the narrow gate now are pursuing the maintenance of a pure heart. And then verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. Once you have come into the kingdom, you know what you want to do? You want to lead others to have peace with God. And you want to lead others to have peace with other brothers and other sisters within the kingdom because you now are at peace with God. You now are a peacemaker and a witness and one who wants to reach others with the gospel that Jesus has preached so that you can be a peacemaker and lead others to have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you promote peace between brother and sister in the kingdom of heaven. And what is the result of living like this? All of this is a progression. This is like the mighty Mississippi River flowing downstream and it's building and it's, and it's swelling uh, current until it comes down now to the Gulf of Mexico and is ready to, to pour out multiple rivers that have fed into it And as we come down to verse 10, 
This is the force and the impact of living according to the first seven Beatitudes. You will stand out like a bright star on a dark night. And you now will be the object of the resistance of the world. And there will be a rejection by the world. If you live like this, you are living so different, so opposite of what the world wants you to live like. And now you are, a, a, you are like swimming upstream uh, against the current of this world. And you will be rubbing people the wrong way. And it will create tension within families and tension in offices and tension in the marketplace and in neighborhoods and in schools because your life is headed in a totally contrary way. And so the result is verse 10. And it is so important. It is the only beatitude that is repeated twice. It is as if there is a a double blessing now upon the one who is persecuted. And so in verse 10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And please note how verse 10 ends. It is how verse 3 ends. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Every other beatitude in between ends in a different way. This is a literary unit. This is brackets on on both sides of these eight beatitudes. These are the the bookends on, on both sides. This is a literary device called inclusio or inclusion that it signifies this is one comprehensive unit of truth that begins in verse 3, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and it concludes in verse 10, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And when he says, is the kingdom of heaven, he is referring, he is saying, these are the ones who are in the kingdom of heaven. And this is where it ends up for those who are poor in spirit, for those who mourn over their sin. For those who do not laugh at all the jokes in the office. For those who do not laugh at the filth that's on television. But instead weep and mourn over sin in the world and sin in my own life. All of this results in being persecuted in this world. So blessed are you, verse 11, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad. And that's what the word blessed means in its secondary sense, full of joy, full of gladness. Rejoice, because your reward in heaven is great, and you have now aligned yourself with the prophets of old, many of whom paid the ultimate price in their death on behalf of the kingdom of heaven. This ends like a symphony with a mighty crescendo at the end with a full fanfare in verses 10 through 12. This is the second tier of the Beatitudes. And this identifies those who have come through the narrow gate. So let me ask you tonight, how does this relate to you? How does this intersect with your life? What does this say to you tonight? Are you in the kingdom? Has Jesus said to you, for yours is the kingdom of heaven? Have you entered through the narrow gate and entered into the kingdom of heaven? And if you have entered through the narrow gate, 
And if you're on the narrow road, how does this describe your life? Please notice the emphasis that Jesus makes upon the heart and upon the inner person, the inner being. All of Israel had externalized their religion. It was all about ritual and routines and activities. And Jesus says, no, everything in my kingdom begins in the heart. It begins in the soul. It begins in your innermost person. So as we start this Man of God conference, and as we begin our time together, these Beatitudes speak to every one of us here tonight. Whether you're outside the kingdom and need to come in, whether you're inside the kingdom and need to progress down the narrow path, whoever you are, wherever you are, this has your name and it has my name written on it. And Jesus would say to us tonight, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because the real you is what God is doing in your heart. The real you is the spiritual condition of your soul. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. May God use this time that we will spend together to truly bring our hearts to where they need to be before our great God in heaven. Let's close now in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, there's a sense of awe within our, within our souls tonight. We feel as if we have been standing with the crowd 2,000 years ago that came pouring out of the cities and the villages to come hear the great sermon of the great king over his kingdom. And Lord, I pray that you will give us understanding of what Jesus is saying in these, in these Beatitudes, and that you will give us great receptivity, and that you will use these words, some to usher into the kingdom, and others to usher us along in the kingdom. Lord, I pray that the fullness of this blessedness would rest fully upon us in fullest measure, in fullest experience within our own hearts and souls. So, Father, I commit these men and myself to you and ask now that you would bring this instruction to our hearts and lives and make us what you desire us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen indeed. I love the ministry of Dr. Lawson for a lot of reasons, but one is there is without question